All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everybody to today's applicant seminar. Uh, today we have Katie Lester, um, who is applying to be to join us as an associate research scientist. Um, so go ahead and take it away, Katie. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Again, my name is Katie Lester. I'm currently a visiting lecturer at Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts. Um, but a lot of this work was done the last few years when I was a postdoc at NASA Ames, working with the, the speckle group there. So started a lot of this um, while I was at NASA and continuing it now um, while I'm at Mount Holyoke. So all of my research is focused on trying to study planets in binary star systems. And um, in general, hopefully most of you care about planets, but you know, the main goals for studying extrasolar planets is trying to figure out if there are other planets like Earth, how common these Earth-like planets are. Um, are there other planets that could be habitable, that have at least conditions that are suitable for life? Is there maybe life anywhere else in the universe? Just trying to figure out our place in the whole universe. So the main way we do this is we try to find other planets around other stars and characterize them so we can try to figure out uh, the answers to all these questions. And the first way that we can do this, if you're not familiar with exoplanets, is um, called the radial velocity method or the Doppler method, where we are watching the host star move a little bit as it's kind of getting tugged on by the planet that's orbiting it. And if we can get spectra of the host star over time, we can watch the Doppler shift of the host star as it's kind of getting tugged around by the planet that's orbiting it. So if we can make this radial velocity curve for our um, planet host star, we can, through some other analysis, um, get the mass of the planet, infer the mass of the planet that's kind of tugging on the host star. So this is the first major way that we find and study exoplanets. The other way is called the transit method, where we're looking at the brightness of a star and if the planet passes in front of the star, it's going to block a little bit of the light, cause a dip in the brightness. And um, anytime we see these regular periodic dips, we can infer that there's a planet there. Again, this is called the transit method. Most of the planets that I'm studying were discovered with the transit method. We've been very, very successful at this. Um, we can, if we have enough transits, we get enough signal to noise, we can use the transit depth. So how much the relative percentage of light that gets blocked by the planet and that'll tell us the size of the planet relative to the size of the star. If we know the size of the star, then we can infer what the size of the planet is. And if we find planets that both transit and show radial velocity curves, then we can get the radii and the masses of the planet. And that'll tell us about the bulk density and then the composition of the planet. And we can try to start classifying planets into different types, if they're rocky terrestrial planets like the Earth, if they're gas giant planets like Jupiter. Um, so <clears throat> having both the transit information and the radial velocity information allows us to characterize any planets that we find. This is a planet talk, so I'll have to show this plot. This is the um, mass of the planets that we found and Jupiter masses on the y-axis as a function of the orbital period of the planets in days, both on a log scale. Um, I put the rough positions of the solar system planets there just for reference um, that we found and confirmed about 5,000 planets so far. There's a bunch that we have not um, done the follow-up to confirm them yet, but there's about 5,000 that we have confirmed are true planets. There are all the blue points in this graph. And you can see there's certain clumps, certain empty areas that we can identify. Um, the first, we found a whole bunch of these gas giant planets, very similar to Jupiter, that are orbiting roughly the same distance away from their star that Jupiter is. We found a whole bunch of these gas giant planets that are orbiting really close into their host star that we call hot Jupiters. These have orbital periods of days, so they're very, very close in. We think that they probably formed far out, 
and then migrated inwards to their current positions. But those are a kind of new shocking type of planet that we don't have in our own solar system. Um, we've also found a bunch of these medium-sized planets that um, they're mostly rocky. We call them super Earths. If they're more gaseous, we call them mini Neptunes, but they're a few times the size of the Earth. And they're pretty common in around other um, around other stars. We don't have any super Earths in our solar system, but um, they seem to be a very uh, common and easily formed type of planet around other stars. And probably most importantly for us figuring out if there's life elsewhere in the, in the universe, we're trying to find Earth-like planets, so planets that are the same size as the Earth. Um, and this is very difficult to do because they're very small, so they, the transits that they, if they show transits, they're very uh, shallow transits, usually lost in the noise. Um, they're very hard to follow up with rate of velocities because the Doppler shift is on the order of like centimeters per second, and it's we need really, really high resolution vector apps to study them. Um, we have a lot of candidates that are in this zone that just haven't been confirmed yet, so there are definitely possibilities that are not on this plot, but um, kind of empty region where Earth is really illustrates how difficult it is to find Earth-like planets, but we are working on it, and hopefully we'll find some more soon. So, like I said, I study mostly transiting exoplanets, and in particular, I'm interested in planets that orbit one star in a binary system. So we have, um, these are circumstellar planets, not circumbinary planets, but we have a planet orbiting one star. If there's a second star nearby, it's going to add extra light into our observations and end up diluting the transit that we see. So um, if normally, you would see the transit is like this deep. If you add the extra light from your companion star, the transit depth is going to be underestimated. And since we base our planet radius off the transit depth, any if we're underestimating underestimating the transit depth, we're going to um, really strongly underestimate what the planet radius is, and that's going to affect what composition we infer for these planets. So. It's really important to, first of all, know whether or not your host star has a stellar companion. And if it does, try to take measurements of it, try to find the brightness so you can correct for this um, observational bias. This becomes really important for small planets if we're trying to find Earth-like planets, because the light from the second star might completely wash out the transit and we might not even detect transits from these small planets. Um, this is an example of planets that we looked at um, from tests that we followed up with high resolution imaging to figure out if they were single um, single host stars or binary host stars. So the plot shows the planet radius on the y-axis and the planet period on the x-axis. If we found that the host star was a single star, it's plotted in blue. If we found that the host star has a binary companion, it's plotted in purple. And you can see for the large planets, they're roughly evenly distributed. But um, <clears throat> for the really small planets, less than about two Earth radii, we hardly detect any of these small planets in binary systems. The light from the companion just completely washes them out, and we can't detect them at all. So if we're trying to calculate occurrence rates, for Earth-like planets or do demographics of Earth-like planets. We're, if we don't know if we're looking at single or binary stars, then we might be missing a whole bunch of these planets and all of our demographics and um, occurrence rates that we calculate might be wrong. So again, knowing whether or not your host star is a single star or if that's a companion is really, really important um, if you're trying to figure out occurrence rates or planet demographics. And the way that we can answer this is doing high resolution imaging follow up of any planet hosts that we find with like Kepler or TESS. So um, the left picture here is a 
ground-based image of a planet host that we've detected from Kepler. There's um, the host star at the center. There's a pretty wide companion, maybe 50 arc seconds away. And the middle panel shows what this star would look like to Kepler. Kepler has pretty big pixels, so it's a little bit more boxy, but we could detect the transit around the center star and still be able to separate out the this wide companion. That wouldn't be an issue. So we observe the star, the Kepler observes the star, <clears throat> and we think that there's a small planet around this maybe G-type star. We might be able to um, better characterize it. But if we take high resolution images of this planet host, either with speckle interferometry, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, or like adaptive optics imaging, then you might find that if you zoom in on the center star, there's actually a second star there. So this host star actually has a companion. And if you correct for this extra light from the companion, then you would get a larger transit depth, you'd get a larger planet radius. So what you thought might have been a small Earth-like planet is actually maybe a gas giant planet. And you would never know this unless you followed up all of your host stars with speckle imaging or adaptive optic imaging to kind of confirm that you're getting the right planet properties. So this um, high, resolu high resolution imaging is, is really important for planet characterization and um, demographics. So hopefully I've convinced you that um, having a stellar companion around an exoplanet host star definitely complicates the detection and characterization of exoplanets. It's going to affect any demographics and occurrence rates that you're trying to calculate. And we typically see stellar companions around about 50% of exoplanet host stars, at least solar type exoplanet host stars. And these companions are pretty common. So this is a pretty common problem that you might have if you study uh, transiting exoplanets. A lot of the time, people ignore any host stars that have a stellar companion. They throw them out from their survey because it does get really complicated and you might not want to deal with it. So for better or for worse, um, most exoplanet surveys are only focused on planets around single stars, which is great because it's less complicated and you might get you know, more accurate answers, but you're kind of missing half the picture. If half of exoplanet host stars have companions, what about those planets? What are they like? Um, are planets around single stars different or the same to planets in binary systems? Um, so that's kind of the main goal of my research is figure out the other half of the picture of how um, binary companions affect planets. From a more I don't know, planet formation theory point of view, we think that companions to exoplanet stars cause a lot of problems when they're forming planets. Um, if you have a closer companion, it could either truncate the protoplanetary disk when the stars are forming, it might completely disperse the disk altogether. So we think it's probably more difficult to form planets in binary systems, but not impossible. So this plot is showing um, the percentage of stars that have protoplanetary disks in the same cluster as a function of the binary separation. So this blue blue bar is the percentage that um, they found for single stars in the cluster. They found about 80% of the single stars have protoplanetary disks. But um, <clears throat> for the closed binaries, where the separations of the binary are on you know 10 to 100 AU scales, they found that only about 30 to 40 percent of these binaries have protoplanetary disks. So the presence of a close companion is really strongly affecting the um, the disks and then the planet formation within those systems. For wider binaries, when the stars are more than about 100 AU apart, they typically don't affect planet formation as much. We find the same percentages of um, protoplanetary disks around these stars as around single stars. So it's really just the close the close companions that are going to cause problems. We think that also the presence of a close stellar companion could 
affect planets after they form, so they can cause migration of planets. There's no way that the hot, hot Jupiters might have formed if they um, kind of got sent to smaller orbits around their host star. It could completely scatter planets, kick them out of the system completely. So we think it's fairly dangerous game trying to form and keep planets alive uh, in binary systems, but it's not impossible because we have found some planets in these close binary systems. Um, this plot is showing the planet occurrence rate for single stars in um, from a, a radio velocity sample was about 18% um, for close binary systems. It's a lot lower. It's only about 4%, but it's not zero. We have seen some planets in these close binary systems. And then on average, you know, for all of the, the stars that they studied, it was about uh, 16%. So we have seen a lot of these planets in close binary systems. We're trying to figure out how they could exist there. Um, maybe if there are certain binary environments where planets can still form and survive in, are there any environments where maybe no planets could form and survive in? Um, that's something we're still trying to figure out how these stellar companions affect planet formation. And that's pretty much the major goals of, of my project is figure out what type of binary systems these planets can form and survive in, either like physical properties of the binaries, the orbital or dynamical properties, and try to compare like observationally, um, try to figure out observationally how these stellar companions can really affect planet formation. And to do this, we need to measure the orbits of these binary systems that host planets and try to figure out their dynamical environments. So there's three kind of factors that we're going to take into account when we're answering these questions. The first is how far apart the two stars in the binary are, their separation. Um, we've seen a lot, of it, a lot of evidence where closer binaries are going to prevent planets from forming. Wider binaries might still keep planets, um, might allow them to form. So trying to figure out how binary separation plays into it um, will be really important. The other property that we can look at is the binary's inclination. So, you know, if, if the binary or is orbiting edge on versus face on, how the binary orbit is um, tilted compared to the planet's orbit, how maybe that makes a difference. Um, so trying to observationally determine maybe which binary inclinations allow planets to form. And then the last one is the binary eccentricity. So how does a binary being a circular orbit versus an eccentric orbit, how does that affect planets forming? Um, we'll see. It's probably easier to form planets in a circular orbit binaries because there's less tidal forces that come into play. But um, we don't have a lot of observational evidence for any of these things. So that's one thing that we're going to try to figure out. All right, so first, looking in detail at binary separation, um, we think that it is more difficult to form planets in close binary systems. We typically don't see as many planets in these close binaries. Um, and if we want to get observational evidence for this, we typically need to take like one snapshot image of binary system, figure out the separation at one epoch, and then we can kind of infer um, from the projected separation what the physical separation would be. So this was the first part of my project that I started as a postdoc, and we were doing follow-up high-resolution imaging for TESS planet candidates. We were using the speckle cameras on the Gemini North and South telescopes, which as an eight meter telescope, they have an angular resolution of about 26 million arc seconds um, in the red. And for most of the stars that we were looking at, they were at about 100 parsecs away. So we could resolve and find binary companions down to about two AU for most of the stars in their sample. And we observed about 100 or sorry, we observed about 500 tests, planet hosts, 
and we found that about 100 of them had stellar companions that could not be resolved from regular ground-based imaging. We had to use high-resolution imaging. If you're not familiar with speckle imaging, um, this is how it works. You basically, you take really, really short exposure images, 60 millisecond exposures, and we just take thousands and thousands of them and analyze them all together. And the benefit of this is that within each image that we take, we're kind of freezing the distortion from the atmosphere. And um, if we can analyze all the images separately, we can kind of rebuild a diffraction limited images of our star. So let me play this again. So this left-hand image, these are individual images, speckle frames that we get when we're observing. If you do like normal imaging or protometry, you would take a long exposure, you would stack up all these individual images and kind of the end result you'd get would be very blurry, you know, larger point spread function image um, where you would not be able to resolve the stars within the binary system. But if we do this Fourier analysis on all the speckle images, we can kind of build what a diffraction image, is, image of the binary would look like, um, which is what's shown on the right here. So we have the primary star that probably hosts the planet. We can see that there's a second fainter star nearby that we wouldn't be able to resolve with typical um, photometry. For my purposes, I'm very interested in the binary positions, the astrometry. So we do kind of an extra Fourier analysis to figure out the binary positions. Um, <clears throat> since we're taking the Fourier transform of all of our images, we get plots in the Fourier plane and um, binary stars have a very characteristic stripe pattern to them when you, when you look in the Fourier plane. So you have like a couple of bright stripes and you have some darker stripes in between and the separation of the stripes, the contrast, the angle of the stripes all tell you about the separation and contrast and position angle of the binary. So we can use what uh, our host star looks like in the Fourier plane. We kind of make models of what the, um, the Fourier plane looks like for different binary separations and find the best fit relative positions of the second star compared to the first star. Um, so this is an example. If you test out different relative positions, different separations, different position angles, you can kind of make a little chi-squared map. So we have our, our best fit position here, and then we can test all of these different um, relative positions and kind of map out where the one sigma errors would be for our astrometry. So we've done this for um, a whole bunch of stars that we've looked at to get really accurate um, position measurements for our binary systems. And the first results that we have are comparing the projected separation of our planet host stars to binaries in the field that we don't necessarily know if they have planets. We don't, they could, they might not, but they're just a general population of binaries. So um, in this plot, these histograms, the blue solid histograms are the separations of the planet host stars and the purple empty histograms are the separations of field binaries um, with Raghavan at all 2010 that we don't necessarily know they have planets. They probably don't have planets. And you can see that the planet host binaries are shifted a little bit to the right. They occur at longer orbital periods, longer, uh, larger separations. And we see kind of a gap in the histograms at really small separations. So this lack of close companions at small separations really means that it's really hard to form planets in these close binaries. And we think that this is not an observational bias that, I mean, we do have the angular resolution to find these these uh, stellar companions. We're just not seeing them. So we think that this is a true um, lack of planets in these close binaries. You 
compare what we got for Tess Planet Host to what Passwork has gotten for Kepler Planet Host. They basically get the same answer. Um, this is from across it all, 2016. It's the same type of plot. Um, the binaries that have planets from Kepler are these red, red histogram. The binaries probably without planets are the blue histogram curve. And they also found that at smaller separations, we're seeing a lot less planets, um, a lot fewer companions for planet host stars than regular binaries. Um, this, this plot in particular um, is for Kepler planets. Kepler was observing fainter stars that are further away, so they didn't have quite the same angular resolution as we did for the test sample, but um, even for these two different kind of populations of host stars, we do get the same results, which is encouraging. So our answer for binary separation is that the observations do agree with our theories. We think that it is harder to form planets in these close binaries because we don't see as many planet hosts with close companions. So that it's great to confirm that, um, that all of our, our theories are, are correct. So this has been proven in a couple different ways, with different, um, different papers. We think that this is definitely um, definitely true that these close companions are suppressing planet formation. Next up, we have the binary inclination. And from our theoretical like numerical simulations, we think that it's easier to form planets if the orbital plane of the planet is aligned with the orbital plane of the binary system. So what I mean by that, um, example on the left, if the orbital planes are aligned, maybe the planet is face on and the binary system is orbiting face on. Whereas if they're not aligned, maybe the planet is orbiting edge on to our line of sight and the binary system is orbiting face on. So there you know, might be perpendicular orbits to each other. And in order to measure the binary inclination, we think we know that the, these are all transient planets. So we think the planet's inclinations are all about 90 degrees. They're roughly edge on because they have to transit, but we don't know anything about the binary inclinations. And even just having one snapshot epic of the, the binary separations is not gonna tell us anything. We have to really resolve the orbital motion of the binary system in order to figure out what the inclination is. So we have been monitoring about 40 exoplanet host binaries, um, both from Kepler, K2, and from TESS, ones that we think are showing a lot of orbital motion. And we've been observing them with the speckle cameras at Gemini, also the speckle camera at Wynn, and trying to resolve the secondary star in the binary systems, and like watch how it's moving around the primary star to get the visual orbit. So this is an example cartoon, but if the primary star is here at the center, we are trying to measure the relative position of the secondary star and watch as it moves around. And from the visual orbit, we can get the orbital inclination. So we have new observations that we've taken in the last few years. We are combining that with archival observations, um, both from Speckle and from adaptive optics to get longer time baselines, we have um, about at least 10 years of data for the Kepler systems. We have about five, three to five years of data for the test systems. Um, but having the archival astrometry is really important for extending long time baselines because these orbital periods are very, very long, like at least 100 years. So it's, it's slow progress, but having a lot of um, archival data is, is really helpful. So we have all these relative positions. We are um, fitting the visual orbits of these systems with the orbitize package. And um, that'll give us information like estimates for the orbital period, the inclination, the eccentricity um, of, of the binary system. And so far we have enough data for 13 of our binaries to actually get preliminary orbits. The other ones um, we might only have one or two data points that we can't quite get in orbit yet, but we are working on it. So just gonna show you some examples. 
This one is KY 1961. It's a Kepler planet system. And in these plots, the primary star is here at the cross, and then our measured positions for the secondary star are these colored points, colored by based on um, the source telescope. And from the orbitized fit, any possible orbits that we can that fit our observations are shown as these gray curves going around here. So the left panel shows just the orbit on the plane of the sky, and then the right panel shows the changes in the position angle on the separation over time. So we can use these to fit possible orbits. Like I said, the orbital periods are pretty long, so we don't have like a lot of data. We haven't covered, we probably covered 10% of the orbit. <laughs> So there's, um, there's still some uncertainty in what's happening on the other side of the orbit that I'm well aware of. But um, even with only a few percent orbit coverage, we can start to nail down the the inclination of the orbit if it's an edge-on or face-on binary orbit. Um, this is that same system. On the bottom left, this is a plot of basically the inclination for all of the best fit orbits that we get. And um, for this system, the best fit inclination is about 64 degrees. So even having just a few data points, we can already start nailing down the binary inclination. Just for reference, if you want to know, um, the system's about 13th magnitude. It's a probably solar type star, and it has a, an Earth-sized planet going around it. This is another example. This is KY2124. Um, similar system, a little bit lower mass host star, but um, you can see from this orbit, all the data points line up pretty much in a straight line. So this system's orbiting very, very edge on to our line of sight, and we get an inclination almost exactly 90 degrees. So whereas the previous system was a little bit more face on, this one's orbiting a little bit um, almost exactly edge on. To our line of sight. This is what some of the other systems look like. Um, some of them you can see are orbiting pretty edge on, like these two. Um, some of them look ugly and are orbiting a little bit more face on. They're harder to constrain when they're face on, but um, some of them we think are not orbiting perfectly edge on. But we can hopefully we'll get new observations soon if. Gemini telescope would stop breaking or getting cyber attacked, and then we would be getting more observations. But hopefully, we'll get more data soon and can uh, better constrain the inclination for some of these systems. Our kind of final result for the binary inclinations is looking at the alignment between the binary orbit and the planet orbit. So, again, we assume that the planets are. Have an inclination of 90 degrees because they're they have to transit the star and um, this plot is a histogram of the sign of the difference between 90 and the binary inclination so if the orbits of the binaries were randomly distributed you would get a flat line you would get equal bins at all values but we see that most of the values um, you know, are in our smallest bin, that um, that means that the binary orbits are also about 90 degrees, that they're well aligned with the planets. We don't find very many systems that are misaligned, where the planets and the binary orbital planes are um, maybe perpendicular to each other. So this observationally confirms what our theories have thought were um, it's easier to form planets when the planet and the binary system are aligned. It's more difficult to form planets when the two are misaligned. We can compare our work to some past work. Um, this is my work on the left. We were actually measuring the orbital motion of the secondary star. You can do a similar type of analysis where you're not necessarily fitting for the orbit, but you're just fitting for linear motion of the secondary star. And you try to estimate the inclination that way. So um, we did this last year with K1-2124. 
Kepler planet hosts and found a very similar result where most of the planets showed good alignment between, or sorry, most of the systems showed good alignment between the planets and the companions. And um, good to see that even with these different methods, you get the same results. Okay, yes, so we think that um, so far our observations have confirmed that the theory is correct, that it's much easier to form planets when the planets and the binary orbital planes are aligned. But at least from our point of view, we would really like to keep monitoring all these systems, get better constraints on the inclination and also increase our sample size since we only had 13 systems. In our paper, we'd like to get the answers for the full 40 that we're monitoring. So hopefully we'll get new observations soon that will um, help us do that. Okay, the last one is the binary eccentricity. There's been um, some work like numerical simulations that have shown that it's more difficult to form planets in eccentric binaries. This kind of makes sense if there's a larger tidal force, every time the binary comes nearby, it's gonna disrupt the planetary system more. This is um, one example from um, Hannah Jane Connell from 2015. Plot gets a little complicated, so I tried to simplify it, but it's basically the binary eccentricity on the y-axis, the binary separation on the x-axis, and the different colored lines are looking at different masses for the host star, and then they each have a lower mass secondary star in the binary system. So if your binary lands like below the rainbow curve in this green area, then planets could possibly form there. If the binary parameters land outside in the like white region, then it's really not possible for planets to form there. So if you have an eccentric binary system, you really have to be at a large separation for planets to form. Um, if you have maybe moderate eccentricity, you could get a little closer in the binary system, but uh, for the most part, it's a lot easier to form planets in lower eccentricity binaries. So it'd be great if we could make plots like this for actual real systems, you know, observational systems, and confirm this result. So we are that's one thing that we're working on currently, trying to measure the eccentricities. Um, <clears throat> this really requires both a visual orbit for the binary and a spectroscopic orbit, since there's some degeneracy in the inclination and the eccentricity that we measure. So it's difficult to do with just the visual orbit alone, but um, we are trying. So um, this is an example from our collaborators at Caltech who measured both the spectroscopic orbit and the astrometric visual orbit for KOI5, which is a actually a triple system where there's a planet around the primary star. And they measured the orbit of the inner binary, both with um, speckle interferometry and with radial velocities. And they could um, get the eccentricity that it was a fairly eccentric binary system and also it's not orbiting the planet and the binary system are not orbiting in the same plane. They're probably misaligned. So this is a little bit um, surprising that we could still have a planet in this system, even though it was fairly eccentric and fairly um, misaligned. So we're hoping to do a similar analysis for all of the other um, stars in our sample. We are continuing our observational monitoring campaign um, both on the speckle imaging side at Gemini and Wynn, and trying to get radio velocities um, both at Keck and CTIO to at least get partial spectroscopic orbits for all of our systems so we can um, get all of the orbital parameters for these stars, the period, the eccentricity, the inclination, and really kind of figure out what type of binary environments, what type of dynamical environments these um, planets can form and survive in. So this is still ongoing. It's a long-term campaign, so it's going to be a few more years. 
but if we can get visual orbits and spectroscopic orbits, we can try to look at planet formation as a function of different binary parameters, um, these orbital parameters, but also maybe looking at mass ratio. Is it harder to form planets in equal mass binaries or binaries where there's a lower mass companion? Maybe the stellar parameters might make a difference. We know that it's easier to form planets in metal-rich systems around single stars. Is that still true for binary systems? So trying to figure out if there's any trends with the, um, the binary like physical parameters and also the orbital parameters. Long future plans. Um, we would really like to start characterizing the planets in these systems. A lot of them have not been done for rate of velocity follow-up because they're in a binary system and it gets more complicated, but we'd like to get, you know, really precise rate of velocity observations to actually map the orbits of the planets themselves so we can get the planet masses and the compositions and try to figure out, you know, what kind of planets can live in binary systems, how their properties compare to planets in single star systems. You know, maybe only small Earth-like planets can live in binaries. Maybe only you know, Jupiter-like planets can live in binaries. So it'd be great to actually characterize the planets themselves and kind of get more information about the system as a whole. That's probably more of a long-term effort because it'd be nice to have the binary orbits before we can do this so we can probably account for it when we study the planets. But um, we have some collaborators at Caltech who are starting to work on this and hopefully we'll, we'll get to it soon. Um, that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Just to recap, we are trying to build out the orbital demographics for planet host binaries, doing this long term observational modern campaign to get their orbits, and really try to figure out how these stellar companions affect planet formation and what type of binaries planets can form and survive in, and compare them to planets around single stars. So we get much more complete picture of planet formation than looking at single stars alone. So stay tuned. Hopefully we'll have more results soon. But thank you for listening and happy to take any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Katie. Uh, anybody feel free to ask questions. I see Grace has her hand up. Hi, Katie. First of all, thank you for a really excellent talk. Um, Second, I wanted to ask about circumbinary disks. So presumably in the wide separation case, you have or you can have um, circumstellar disks, but in the close binary separation, you have circumbinary disks. So is the idea that you don't form planets close to circumbinaries um, because the disks get truncated at close, fairly close distances to the circumbinary? Is that the idea? I think you can still form planets, circumbinary planets, you know, the planets around both stars, because we have seen some of them. We have, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but there might be maybe 20 that we found um, planets that are orbiting both stars in the binary system. I think if the protoplanetary disk or the circumbinary disk is far enough away, then it would not be as affected and you could still form the planets in it. I think the planets would have to form far enough out where they wouldn't get ripped apart by the, the binary system. But yeah, I think you would not be it, able to form really close. And that planets. would affect the planets that you could detect, um, certainly via the, the transit method, right? Because the further away they are, if the inclination is a bit off, you won't see them, right? <laughs> Yeah, they're really hard to detect, and they even if they do show a transit, the stars are moving, so the transit doesn't happen at the same time the next time. So they're they're really hard to follow up because they're not periodic. So it's um, oh. it's yeah, it's really complicated to try to find circumbinary planets. But it's very okay. cool. Okay, but... thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Bea, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, so what about the, the mass ratio between the the stars? Have you looked at it or would you expect that would influence uh, planet formation? 
Yeah, that's a great question. We are, we've looked at it a little bit. Um, we have some systems where the mass ratio is about the same. They're roughly the same mass. We have others where they're um, maybe about half the mass. The secondary is about half the mass of the primary. Um, that's one thing that we want to investigate in the future, but I think, um, I mean, having a lower mass companion it probably is exerting weaker tidal forces. It probably is easier to keep the planet around, um, but as long as the stars are far enough apart, then an equal mass companion might not cause too many problems, but um, yeah, it's definitely, I would definitely like to look into that because I think you're right that it would definitely um, you hopefully see that trend with the mass ratio. Go ahead, Naylan. Yeah, um, uh, great talk. Uh, um, I have a question. Um, actually, I have two questions. Uh, um, the first one uh, for on slide 12, uh, is it possible for you to? Yeah, so uh, to the right of this, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I think there is an observational selection effect. Uh, planets with uh, long periods are uh, difficult to detect. So um, have you tried uh, to uh, sort of de-bias and uh, see uh, uh, de-bias bias these results? And then uh, uh, there should be uh, more uh, to the right of this plot. Uh, yeah. So that, okay. That's, yeah, that's definitely true. That's a good point. Um, these are all planets that were discovered by TESS, which only has a 24 day observing window. So yeah, TESS cannot detect the long period planets. Um, there are some that had multiple um, like t test sectors of data, but we haven't really looked at trying to de-bias that and figure out how it is for longer period planets. Um, I think in terms of this other observational bias mm -hmm. where the, the small planets get hidden, I think it would be the same effect since um, you know, the transit depth would get washed out either way for if it was a short period or a long period planet. So I, I think we'd get similar results, but um, yeah, I'm not sure for like the Kepler sample that has a longer, you know, four years of data that has longer period planets if they've looked at a plot like this, that would be that would be interesting to look at. Yeah. Uh, the, the other question, um, if I recall right, uh, you showed the number of uh, uh, binaries with planets uh, as a function of the separation uh, of the binary. Uh, yeah. Um, so I was wondering, um, instead of the <clears throat> uh, separation, if you look at uh, the separation between the host star and the planet divided by the separation between the uh, binary star, um, whether that plot could uh, provide additional physics. Uh, has anybody looked at the number of uh, uh, cases versus uh, that ratio? Um, I can't remember if I made this plot. Hold on. Um, I think it will take me. The first paper that I published that um, for this sample, we made kind of a similar plot with applied the planet separation and the binary separation 
on a log scale and the binary separations were at least three orders of magnitude larger than the planets. They were like, okay. very um, well separated. So um, again, these were for test planets, so they're only yeah. close in planets, but for the most part in these systems that, you know, the planets are maybe at one AU and the stars are at, you know, 50 to 100 AU mm -hmm. away. So they're um, maybe not three orders of magnitude, but they're pretty well separated. Um, yeah, probably. That plot, but, sorry, probably sorry. it may uh, be effective uh, if the separation getting uh, closer to each other. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just just curious. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Point. And that's something we want to look at in the future if we can measure the eccentricity. Maybe like there's a trend with the like periastron distance compared to the seven major axis. You know, maybe the the periastron mm -hmm. distance distance tells us something different, but we don't have enough information for that yet. But yeah, that's a great idea. Thanks. Alrighty, uh, do we have any other questions? Okay, well, great. Well, thank you, Katie, so much uh, for your talk. This was uh, very much enjoyable. So, um, yeah, so I'll go ahead and stop the recording now. Thank you for having me. <laughs>